Hello, my name is Richard Uribe. This is part of the Family Medicine and Radiology Educational Series. I will be talking about musculoskeletal x-rays of chest, ribs, clavicle, acromioclavicular or AC, and sternoclavicular SC joints. I have no disclosures regarding this topic. The objective of this PowerPoint is to learn a systematic approach to reading musculoskeletal x-rays of the ribs, clavicle, and the acromion and sternoclavicular joints. We'll review four common adult findings on x-ray and discuss clinical correlation of these x-ray findings. The most common x-ray views in this part of the body include the posterior anterior view of the chest, the bilateral Zanka view, and the serendipity view. When looking at the PA view of the chest, we need to start by focusing on the lung apices and edges to rule out pneumothoraces. From here, we will examine the mediastinum, specifically the sternoclavicular joint, and follow the edges of the clavicle laterally, looking for cortical irregularities, buckling, or evidence of impaction. Evidence of soft tissue swelling or fat pat displacement would increase suspicion of a fracture. As we examine the lateral clavicle, we will examine the articulation with the acromion to form the acromioclavicular joint, making sure there's no displacement or separation. After this, we examine the ribs starting with the first rib and tracing each rib posteriorly. Finally, we will examine the diaphragm to rule out any developing hemothorax. The second common view we will discuss is the bilateral Zenka view, which is an anterior posterior projection with a 10 to 15 degree cephalic tilt. Best at assessing the acromioclavicular joint. One additional important landmark to note is the coracoclavicular distance, which helps us understand the integrity of the coracoclavicular ligament. A normal value is between 1.1 and 1.3 centimeters. This particular x-ray shows an acromioclavicular sprain on the left side. The third common x-ray view we will discuss is the serendipity view, which is an anterior posterior projection with a 40 degree cephalic tilt. It's best at assessing the sternoclavicular joint for dislocation. The four common adult conditions we'll discuss are rib fractures, clavicle fractures, acromioclavicular joint sprains, and sternal clavicular joint sprains. Rib fractures are often seen secondary to a direct blow to the chest, but these injuries can be seen secondary to overuse, compression, or torsion. Patients often complain of localized chest pain and tenderness that's worse with inspiration and or coughing. On physical exam, the patient may be tender to palpation over the thoracic wall. If the rib is displaced, there may be a step off on palpation of the ribs. You should watch out for signs and symptoms of developing tension pneumothorax. These signs include tachycardia, hypotension, jugular venous distension, decreased or absent breath sounds on auscultation, and hyperresonance on percussion. The first imaging you may obtain with rib fractures is the PA view of the chest. When we examine this x-ray, we see the there are cortical discontinuities in the anterior portion of the fourth, fifth, and sixth ribs, but no displacement. Rib fractures are often not seen in a PA view of the chest and may require a 45 degree oblique view on expiration to best diagnose. It takes great force to fracture the first and second ribs given their short length, relative mobility, and protection by other structures in the upper chest. Such fractures can be associated with significant injuries to underlying organs, such as blunt myocardial injury, bronchial tears, or a major vascular injury best examined with a CT of the chest. In patients with multiple fractured ribs of the middle and lower segments, unexplained hypotension may be the result of intra-abdominal bleeding, from the liver or spleen. In this case, would recommend a CT of the abdomen. A tool that has become more useful in rib fractures is ultrasound, as it has been shown to have higher sensitivity 
in diagnosis, and it is useful in assessing for a pneumothorax. In the case of acute rib fractures, respiratory and vascular status must be closely monitored for any signs of tension physiology. The vast majority of rib fractures may be treated conservatively and ultimately entails rest, pain management, and return to activities as tolerated. The next common condition we'll discuss is clavicular fractures, which often occur secondary to a fall on the superior lateral shoulder or outstretched hand or a direct blow to the clavicular region. Two thirds of cl clavicular fractures occur in men and 80% of all clavicular fractures are usually in the middle third of the clavicle. Common physical exam findings include tenderness palpation, swelling, bruising over the clavicle. If the clavicle is displaced, you may note a step off or even skin tenting if one of the fragments is superiorly displaced. If there is brachial plexus or subclavian injury, the patient may also have neurovascular abnormalities, including numbness, tingling, and skin changes. A clavicular fracture can often be diagnosed with the PA view of the chest. On the x-ray to the right, we can see that the right clavicle shows a mid-clavicular fracture with three fragments. Another x-ray that may be helpful in assessing clavicular fractures is the bilateral Zenka view. The x-ray to the right shows a displaced fracture of the left clavicle, as well as a acromioclavicular sprain on the right. Additional imaging for clavicular fractures would be an AP 45 degree cephalic tilt film focused on the clavicle. If there's a lateral clavicular fracture with displacement, an axillary view will help examine for posterior displacement. If there's concern for interthoracic injury, recommend CT of the chest. Musculoskeletal ultrasound is also useful in these situations to assess for any cortical step off and hyperemia. The first line treatment for mid and proximal clavicular fractures is non-operative management as it has a 99% healing rate, but there is a 15 to 25% risk of non-union. Non-operative management includes a sling, a sling with swath, or a figure eight brace. There is no difference in functional outcomes between these options. Immobilization is usually discontinued at three to four weeks, and once the clavicular fracture was healed, range of motion and strengthening exercises should begin. Indications for surgical management of clavicular fractures include mid-chap fractures with over 100% displacement and over two centimeter shortening, open fractures, comminution, tenting, neurovascular injury, unstable scapular fractures, polytrauma, and unable to tolerate immobilization. The third common condition we'll discuss is acromioclavicular sprains, which often occur secondary to a direct blow to the upper shoulder or a fall on an outstretched hand. On physical exam, you may note tenderness to palpation over the AC joint, clavicle or shoulder region. The patient may have pain with cross arm adduction and the pain may radiate up the neck, trapezius and or interlateral deltoid. You may also notice horizontal and or vertical instability of the AC joint. The best x-ray view to examine AC joint injuries is the bilateral Zanka view. On the x-ray to the right, you can see an intact clavicular cortex. The coracoclavicular distance on the left is increased, given that the increase is more than 25 to 50%. Compared to the right, there's strong evidence that there's a complete tear of the coracoclavicular ligament. One of the most common classification systems to assess AC sprains is the Rockwood classification. Classifications are based on acromioclavicular or AC ligament and coracoclavicular or CC ligament integrity, as well as displacement of clavicle in reference to normal alignment of the joint. A grade one sprain has normal ligament integrity, no displacement. A grade two sprain has an intact AC ligament, but a tear in the CC ligament. A grade three sprain has tear in both ligaments, 
with 100% displacement of the clavicle. A grade four has a posterior displacement of the clavicle into or through the trapezius. Grade five has superior displacement of the clavicle, 100 to 300% with a cortical clavicular distance two to three times longer than the opposite AC joint. And the grade six brain has an inferior displacement of the clavicle into the subacromial or subcoracoid space. Additional imaging you may use is an axillary view of the shoulder to better assess for posterior displacement of distal clavicle. A striker notch view should be used if concerned for a coracoid fracture, specifically if the CC distance is normal, but the AC joint is disrupted. Ultrasound is useful in evaluation of AC joint injuries. You can often see a joint effusion and or a geyser sign. Treatment options are dependent on the severity of the injury. Non-displaced or minimally displaced injuries can be treated with a sling for three to seven days using ice as needed for pain and swelling. Return to activity may be based on Gladstone's protocol. Operative management is preferred in sprains with significant displacement, like a Rockwood grade four and above or a grade three that has failed non-operative treatment. The last condition we'll review is the sternoclavicular sprain. Patients often have pain with movement of their upper extremity. If you notice any sign of shortness of breath, choking, or difficulty swallowing, it should lead you to be concerned for a posterior dislocation of the clavicle. On physical exam, you may note the patient holding his arm across their chest or close to their body. Over the sternoclavicular joint, you may note tenderness of palpation, crepitus, swelling, and deformity. The pain may be worse with lying supine, and you may also note that the shoulder does not lie flat on the table. On palpation, there may be a palpable step off over the sternoclavicular joint with instability or subluxation. If there is posterior dislocation, there may be venous congestion. SC sprains are best seen with the serendipity view. On the x-ray to the right, at the center of the picture, there's a malalignment and an anterior dislocation of the sternoclavicular joint. Grading of the sternoclavicular sprain is as follows. Grade one shows a stable joint with intact sternoclavicular and costoclavicular ligaments. Grade two shows a sublux joint with a tear in sternoclavicular ligaments, but an intact clostercurricular ligaments, and grade three shows a dislocated and complete tear in ligaments. Additional imaging in these injuries include a CT scan with coronal re reconstruction if there's concern for fracture or intrathoracic injury. Ultrasound is useful in evaluation of SC joint injuries. You can often see a joint effusion and or a geyser sign as well. Treatment options depend on severity. If there's a significant dislocation, the next step is close reduction of the joint. Non-operative management is preferable and entails a short period of immobilization if it's a grade one or a four to six week immobilization with a figure eight sling if a grade two. Pain management can be done with NSAIDs and ice as needed. If the joint is symptomatically unstable, the preferred treatment is operative management. In all, common injuries in the ribs, clavicles, and S AC, SC joints include fractures, sprains, and dislocations. X-ray is a first-line tool in assessing theoretically stable patients. In terms of rib fractures, you can use a PA view or a 4 to 5 degree oblique view of the chest. Clavicular fractures in AC, SC joint sprains may also be diagnosed with a simple PA view of the chest but may require a focused zinc view in the case of AC joint sprains or a focused serendipity view in the case of SC joint sprain. If there's any concern for secondary interthoracic or intra-abdominal injury, ultrasound and CT scan are valuable tools in evaluation and in determining management of patients' medical conditions. 
Last of all, these are the references used for this presentation.